Welcome to the Martin Luther King Weekend National Racing Report. Jason blew it with the week off. It's Richard Migliori joining me, Andy Sterling, here in the studio at Aqueduct. We've got some trips to make around the country and some Triple Crown preps at uh, fairgrounds. Yeah, sprinkling of, I think, just about everything this week. And uh, it's always fun when you've got a diverse group of races to look at. Yeah, I'm not sure when we take a look at those fairground races what implications those will have later on, but some nice races to look at. And we had some stakes here in New York as well. And I thought we started out with a nice one. And we ran the Interboro here, Richie. And we've seen this group together before. But I think the little bit of rest that Willett may have gotten since her last start did her some good. Yeah, I think the big question about Willett was, is she as good? Is she basically finished? I mean, her last few races looked a bit hungry, I think. But the way she looked in the paddock, you kind of got the feeling the good Willett was going to show up. Yeah, and the good Willett did show up. And the other thing about her was, you know, last time out probably was closer to the pace than she's most comfortable being. Now, maybe because she was coming off of eight days since her prior start, I don't know the reason, because it was a pretty hot pace. Today, or in this race, she was just able to drift back, and that's the spot she's most comfortable in. After breaking very alertly, yeah. I rather tease allowed her to drop back. I think last time, Andy, it might have been more a function of the racetrack. Riders have that's a tendency it. to want to put horses more in the game, in the mud. Um, this time, she dropped back, she found her stride, and what impressed me, keep an eye on I rather tease. He knows he has the leaders. He's glancing behind him to see, I guess, if, if expression is coming. You know what, he's going to take a peek right there. He's going to take another peek coming up. This is when a, a rider has so much horse under him, he knows he has the horses in front of him. I have a question for you, though, and you're right. You can see her leveling off, and he's not even asking her at this point. It seems like the Ortiz boys spend an awful lot of time looking over their shoulder. When you were a rider, did you look over your shoulder that often? I, no, very rarely looked over my shoulder like that. I, you, you might take a peek here and there, especially if you were on a good horse. I definitely couldn't look over my shoulder anymore because I can't turn my <laughs> neck. But uh, it was frowned upon. Uh, it, it, honestly, m riders did not look back very much in, in my era. You were supposed to ride, go forward, assume that someone's coming. Now, obviously, I'm not a rider for a variety of good and bad reasons, but can't you hear them coming? Not really. No? You'd be surprised. Between the wind and your own horse's hoof beats, you, you really can't. So, I mean, but it's okay to take a peek, but I think we might have to install rear view mirrors on the sides of their goggles. Yeah, maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. I just feel like sometimes a rider loses his flow with a horse and he turns to look around, and you're better off riding because the truth is if they're coming, they're coming. Oh, yeah, and, and the worst feeling in the world is when you're looking back and all of a sudden there's one right there, <laughs> and you go, oh, my gosh, I've already messed it up. Now you've got to try to get your horse going. It's not like driving a car. You don't just step on the accelerator and they instantly pick it up. They've kind of got to build into it, but he was awfully confident and, and rightfully so. Yeah, he was. And Expression actually ran pretty well, all things considered, in here. And she was the fortunate recipient of Willett not running her best race last time out when she got it done. And she's improved a lot for Charlie yeah. Baker. Does a good job. But when the good Willett shows up, she's a little better than these. Yeah, she was good. And, and actually, I'd even asked Jimmy Island if that was going to be her last start where they were looking to retire. She is a seven year old mare. And I think this illustrates it's not a horse's age, it's the form they're in that really counts. And uh, Jimmy Island said they might look at the Barbara Fritchie still. Good. I'm glad she's going to continue to race because she's a very, very nice horse. Another nice horse and a group of nice horses set up for the Holly Hughes here on Sunday's card. And I think it was an odd situation. We had the clear speed with I'm Stoked and the other speed with Captain Sirius. But frankly, they were able to slow it down quite a bit. And it made it very tar hard for any of the closers, especially Big Business, the Pink Richie, closing force four wide in a slow pace. Not easy. Yeah. And, and as we're watching Jose Ortiz repeatedly look under his shoulder behind him as we just got done talking right. about that. He loves uh, to do it. Yeah. I mean, they actually really controlled the race. The two Michael Hush and horses, I'm Stoked and the winner, Captain Sirius. And uh, Captain Sirius looked like he was going to really draw off here, and I almost think he got to wander in a bit, and he, he maybe lost interest. I, I felt the same way. I mean, I had liked him in top of the stretch. I thought he'll win by anything here, and he almost, I mean, right here, looks like he could possibly finish fourth or fifth, and I was wondering if he just lost his focus. That's what it looked like to me. You know, it's interesting. Ever since they tried to stretch him out, and rightfully so, it almost seemed to me like maybe he lost a touch of that sprinter speed that he possesses, and now that he's kind of coming from just off the pace, when he hit the front, he definitely looked like he lost his focus because he reasserted himself when the four crafty dreamer came alongside. Yeah, I'm going to tell you though, Richie, I'm a little disappointed in this horse. I mean, I'm not trying to be too hard on him. He's obviously a very talented horse and he's run some very nice races. This was his race to win by three or four lengths and regardless of wandering, he didn't do it. He's failed in some spots where he's had some good trips and overall, I'm not sure he's going to reach the potential we thought he might have as a three-year-old. Well, again, I think it illustrates when a horse is 
as naturally fast as him and you try to stretch him out and even though he ran well I believe it was in the uh, Dwyer yeah he did run well. um, he never has seemed to get back to that same sprinter speed that he possessed and it shows how tough it is to do and you think back over the years horses like Groovy who ran in the Derby that were able to do that it's a pretty remarkable thing for a horse to do and one thing we have to touch on I think that was Michael Hushin's sixth Holly use. Are they, they going to rename it the Michael Hushin? Uh, we should rename something for Mike Hushin. I mean, you and I are on the same page with Mike. Uh, I don't think there's a better trainer in the country than Mike Hushin. It's just a question of the horses he gets, but he does a fabulous job. With he really it. does. Yeah. We'll turn our attention now to a stake race we ran on Friday, and this race had to be rescheduled from the prior week, and this was the Musanda. It got much tougher. Not only did you get a horse been here before in there, but you also got over-prepared to come up from Florida. Over-prepared the two. She took advantage of her inside post. Both Godolphin horses failed to break. Boy, when, when you've got an entry, they both get off poorly. You're just a little bit snake bit there. You just be, completely took them out of the game. And over-prepared, who's a nice filly, get everything her own way. She had everything her own way. I want to ask you about the ride that the one got in your opinion before. You see her on the inside. She ran up on heels of the three in front of her. Do you agree, and the rider was kind of behind the eight ball, to say the yeah. least, with a bad start. He lets her roll up the front. Is this what you would do, or is it just a tough hand and you're supposed to not restrain her too much? I, I, I would have approached it different, and, and other people might disagree with me. I think once you kind of dealt that hand, you've got to just play it and, and, and try to stay in and save ground and pick your way and hope and not like kind of let them use all their energy in one burst to get there because you're not going to be able to finish that. No, hand. she's not. And it's interesting because it's actually funny. You talk about looking over your shoulder. There's a point in this race around the turn when the horse is three wide now, been here before, actually gets ahead of overprepared. Yet Erod Ortiz looks over his shoulder. You don't see too many guys who have been passed on the lead, and you're going to see it coming up soon. Look behind him. So he actually knew, and I don't even think he knew that horse got left, but he knew he had that horse beat. You see him, he looked over his shoulder, and he was yeah. behind the horse. Yeah, he was completely unconcerned with the horse next to him. And it more is you're listening to the other rider. He's asking that horse. He's smooching at that horse. He's tapping him on the shoulder. And you're still sitting. You go, well, wow, he's already asked for his best, and I've still got horse. You, you basically go, ah, he doesn't belong. I'm fine. Well, he was clearly right. I remember watching the race and thinking, geez, the rod isn't concerned at all with the horse outside of him, and it was the horse behind him who got a very good ride by Junior Alvarado, Liberty Island, who ran very well for Don Moscatino, but this was a moderately paced race where the horses that ran 1-2 had those sweet inside trips, and even the third finisher, that horse was inside behind them. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And Liberty Island, though, I, I like this really because she showed a completely different dimension. In her first start, she was out in the clear the whole way, didn't have to take any kickback. I like the fact that she showed she has some quality by being able to do that and still finish. Now, over-prepared, if we were doing trips for horses at Laurel, she would have been a trips and traps yeah, horse off of our last race, and she certainly got the right trip this time. She did. This race came up slow, Richie. It got a yeah. 67 buyer. You looked at the time. You knew it wasn't a good race. So I'm a little dubious of these horses going forward. Forward. And I don't think it's going to get a lot easier for overprepared. We saw Prince of Silmar win this race. I don't think she's another Prince of Silmar. Well, you think back to when Prince of Silmar won it. She exploded through the stretch. This was more work than life. Yeah, it was. We'll see where she goes from here. We'll see where they all go. You do want to look at the Godolphin horses that got left. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be heading down to New Orleans and then another trip out to California. Well, we've had some nice races in New York. It's time to hit the road, and hit the road we will as we head down to fairgrounds. And I thought for the first two preps down there, the Silver Bullet Day for the Phillies, we'll see second, and the LeCompte for the Colts, these came up pretty tough races. As a matter of fact, a horse a lot of people have been talking about, Eagle, a horse for Neil Howard. He was in the LeCompte. He drew, unfortunately, in the far outside, and he was not a major factor. The horse I want to talk about early, the six will get steady, runs for fourth, the seven in here, and that's a horse run happy that caught a lot of people's attention. This horse runs off for Sean Bridgeman. He's got talent, but with his connections, he's a horse that may never get a chance to show it. 
Yeah, and that's a shame because he obviously is kind of, and he got compromised at the break as well. Horse inside of him, I believe it was the five horse, broke out and bothers the six and the seven. And then a lot of times what happens, once the horse gets bothered, they get bumped, they panic, and they run off. Well, this is exactly what he did. And you can see, Sean, he was lucky to be able to get through horses in the first turn without getting himself in real trouble. Look at him. He's, he's trying to hold the horse back, and they're moving up front. This is not a slow pace. This is a horse, I believe, that Chuck Simon had for, for the famous Mattress Mac. Um, I believe his sister-in-law, who used to be the manager of the furniture store, is now the trainer. There's a reason that guys are professional trainers. This horse has talent. Let's give him a chance. Thrown in this race less than three weeks, too, after breaking his maiden at Turfway at six and a half furlong. Not the way to head to the Kentucky Derby. No, and you have to question, too. I mean, here's a horse, obviously, keen. has got those kind of blinkers on. That tends to make horses keener. Like you said, there's a certain level of professionalism you're looking for. But let's get back to the eventual winner, who's down on the fence here, the one in the Ramsey Cup. I I know the race was slow, Andy. I just like the way he did this. Well, I mean, he's eating dirt down the inside. He's looking for a spot. What's interesting is, boy, Mikel Mania, he, he is not panicking at all when he's got no room and horses with momentum outside of him have easily cleared. Absolutely. He didn't seem like he was concerned a bit. He took his time. He eased out to the clear. And this horse showed a turn of foot. Now, he has been running on the turf, and he had a turn of foot on the turf. This was, in that respect, I thought was impressive, that he could take the dirt, wait, and accelerate. No, I, I don't disagree with any of that, and this was kind of a turfy-type performance by him. Now, he saved ground the whole way. Uh, I don't know how great a race it was, but he did easily run down Tom Amos, and that's something that doesn't happen in 55% of the race or 45% of the race he runs in the fairgrounds, because he's winning at almost a 50% clip. I do like the race he ran in the abstract. I'm just wondering how strong it is. And the other question I have is, I just don't know if these Louisiana races end up being productive going forward, if we can trust these horses in the triple crown races. Well, we've seen it a great deal that they haven't really shown up as good, strong preps for the Derby, at least not in the last few years. Yeah, so I'm wondering who they are. This is a disappointment was Eagle in here. I mean, maybe being far outside, it was a race dominated by horses that spent some time down towards the inside. He made a run of the turn. I mean, he had... He's supposed to show something. Well, that's the thing. I mean, even the run he made around the turn felt like a half-hearted yeah. run. You didn't see anything that went, wow, he was really compromised. That's why the performance was so dismal. It just seemed like a dismal performance. Right, and you would expect, I mean, he had finished well ahead of International Star when they met it uh, at last time at Churchill Downs. He probably should have won the, the, the Kentucky Jockey Club. Mm -hmm. He had a tough trip that day. Neil's not going to have him cranked up, but he should have had more than that. And I think that's another thing to talk about as we head to the Philly prep, the Silver Bullet Day, where the heavy favorite, and probably over bet a little bit, top decile, she was wide in the first turn with Mike Smith, Richie, but there she is sort of getting in the picture on the outside. She runs like Eagle and never gives a real account of herself, but nobody gained ground in here. No, and, and the winner was very comfortable on the lead, but not going particularly slow. I mean, she no, said, I agree. Know, decent enough fractions, and she just went on about her business. Florent Giroux is making some noise down there. Kind of had a coming out with work all week in the Breeders' Cup, had a good year, and that's continued on. The success is built. But I agree with you. I mean, uh, Top Decile moved like she was going to at the least get a piece run. of it and then just flattened out too readily. I agree. She's supposed to run fourth in here. And she, if she runs fourth, beat Nate Lengths, it may be still a disappointment, but you can say she did some running at the end. The winner was a runoff, loose to the lead in the front end. The winner was first time Larry Jones, and we've seen Larry Jones pull up some miracles down at fairgrounds over time. We'll see what she does going forward, but I'll say one thing. Top, top Decile will be back to fight another day. This three-year-old Philly group is wide open. Oh, it's absolutely wide open. It's begging for someone to take control of the of the uh, division. Interesting, uh, I, I heard that um, Take Charge Brandy, who wasn't supposed to start till March, is probably going to run by the end of January now. I guess she's in good form. Hard to believe that Wayne Lucas isn't going to be taking time with one of his horses that's a newly turned three-year-old. Now we'll go and look at some older horses as we head out west, and we run in the La Cunada at Santa Anita. And i got to tell you, Richie, we talked about this before. I hope there's some other horses besides Untappable, who we know is a monster, in this older division because this was not an exciting race. Well, I haven't seen anything to make Untappable worry, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and if this is the best they have to offer, frankly, Untappable will run the table, won't she? No, I mean, horses like this, they, they can't compete with her. We can only hope that Beholder is able to come back, have a campaign where she can put some races together after running only three times last year. I mean, no disrespect to the girl in that song, Jerry Hollendorf, for continues to do an exceptional job. Lexi Lou's a nice horse that comes along for second and handles all surfaces. But the girl in that song buries this field, and her credentials coming in aren't grade two quality. 
No, and, and just like you said, she buried this field. It wasn't even close. I mean, she did get a perfect trip stalking a horse that... I mean, what do you think about JoJo Warrior? Maybe she doesn't want to go that far. Is that it? I, I think that she fooled a lot of people that weren't paying attention by finishing third in the cotillion while riding the goldest of gold rails. And it confused people into thinking she was just a much better horse than she is. She's okay, but this was a terrible performance by her, in all honesty, Richie, yeah. at a pretty short price. And she's not supposed to blow second right. late to Lexi, who's a filly we talked about off camera. That I like a lot just because she's one on synthetic. She's one on, well, ran, uh, one on turf, Ran well now, decent enough anyway, on dirt. I mean, you, you got to respect that she does show up. No, she does show up. Obviously, dirt is her worst surface, but mm -hmm. at least she's able to run competitively on it. And frankly, her connections are waiting until Woodbine opens again, and they're race to take this Ontario bread because they can't take away the fact that she beat the boys in the, Kings, in the Queen's Plate. Yeah, Queen's Plate is big. It's Canada's Derby, and, and uh, she actually gave Mark Cassie his first Queen's Plate victory as successfully he's been there. It took a long time to win it. It did. Well, that does it for the first the middle part of the show, I should say. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to head down south for a little bit of Sunshine Millions action when we come right back. As we come back, I want Mr. Migliori to pay careful attention to this. We will be running eight races the weekdays as we go forward, starting this Thursday, January 22nd, 1.20 post time on the weekdays, which will normally be a Wednesday through Friday, period. And the weekends, nine races, 12.45 post. You got it, Richie? I think I better just show up at one set time because I know I'm going to make a mistake. I think I'm just going to show up like it's the earlier post time all the time. I'm going to show up whenever we show up, but that is the case as we go forward. Sunshine Millions down in Florida. They opened it up to, I think, Maryland breads, New York breads. Maybe Cal breads could still come, Florida breads. Some bunch of breads. Well, we ran the classic, and I'm going to tell you something in here, Richie. The huge disappointment to me was transparent. He broke a little slow, but he was awful. Again, you know, you, you can use an excuse like breaking slow or being wide when a horse at least puts in an effort, but when they get beat the way he did, you really can't use it as an excuse. No, I agree, and I, I thought he got an absolutely terrific ride after that. I mean, Javier did everything to put him in the right position, but you could see at the free ace pole he had nothing. East Hall made his move in here, but you know what? Nobody was catching the horse off the claim for Peter Walder, a great claim by Luch Racing Stable. They come out and they win a quarter of a million dollar race. I noticed how you avoided saying his name because I'm a bit confused how to say it. Senor Something. Kiskeyano. Thanks, thanks, thanks for bringing Kis that up. Kiskeyano. I noticed how you avoided I've learned that. tricks from Jason Blewett. I'm going to talk about him as the son of exclusive quality. He did a little wandering in the stretch, didn't he here? But he did, and it actually might have helped him win. He got away with it. He came out enough. But, uh, you know, I thought he was good. He kind of middle moved into, you know, yeah. what I thought was a pretty sharp pace, and, and he was resolute to the wire. But uh, I'll give it another try. Senor Kiskeyano. He seems like Senior Kiskeano is the horse. Tell you what, Catholic Cowboy was coming off a win the claiming crown. He almost got there for Nick Zito, and really it was the favorites. Wildcat Red, he was on the fast pace, but he was finished a half mile of the race, and once again transparent. He's obviously got issues. At this point, I just wonder what they can do with him going forward. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure they've got to kind of regroup, go back to the drawing board. You know he's better than that if he's okay. I guess we'll find out next time. Won't no, we? he's talented, but he has some issues to run into. I thought the next race was a nice race for New York as they ran the Maryland, the Sunshine Millions excuse me, sprint. The heavy favor was Happy My Way. We saw finish second in the grade one Vanderbilt to Palace. Well, he's cruising on the lead. He's being stalked by the New York bred Weekend Hideaway. I thought Weekend Hideaway might be dead in the turn. Dead he wasn't. He buried the field. He exploded through the stretch and uh, Phil Serpes has done such a great job with this horse. A really good looking horse and Happy My Way got really caught comfortable on the lead and that's the way he wants to run and there was just no answer for uh, Weekend Hideaway, who is a very good sprinter when he runs his A game. And Grand Shores, who ends up finishing second, he's coming up the rail. He's a pretty nice horse as well, but I tell you what, the New York Red makes easy work of this field, and Phil Serpy found a nice $100,000 race for him. And I'll tell you something, this is a kind of field that should be graded. When you think Happy My Way's in there, who ran so well last year, I do wonder, though, after watching this race, if he's the same horse. Yeah, because he, he's a horse that's always done his best running when he gets comfortable on the lead. He was comfortable yeah. on the lead. Now, the first fraction was quick and I was actually going to ask you about this only because the run up at, at Gulfstream is tighter than I ever remembered it to, for the three quarter start. Their, their run up seemed to vary so frequently
recently. I don't know if they vary as much from the dirt as turf that I can't really keep track of it down there. And to be okay. honest with you, I haven't paid as much attention as I have sometimes in the past, but it was a much faster second quarter than it was a first quarter. Yeah. You'll see that in the mile races. You don't see it as much in the six furlong races simply because the second quarter is run around a turn. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, at the same time, Weekend Hideaway was cutting into his margin into that fast second fraction. But I was just a little bit surprised when I watched the race. They were basically on top of the six front pole, more like Pimlico than yeah. what Gulfstream normally does. No, that's an interesting point. They probably didn't have much run-up, which is why we didn't see as fast a first quarter. They ran another Sunshine Millions race down there. And once again, it's a horse we've seen in New York quite frequently, and it's our friend Bobby Flay's Dame Dorothy. She does a little wandering in the stretch in here, and she's four wide right now, but she was a dominating winner here. I thought she looked the winner every step around the turn. She was just towing Edgar into the race. And I think we go back to the uh, the race at Aqueduct was a turn back alarm where, where it was just she, such a slow pace and she really was wrestled with by Javier Castellano. I think she resented it. She did and she was three wide around the track that day against the gold rail so she was against it. She was turning back in this race. She had a lot of things going for her and I think that she's a horse that's already shown she's not one of these Todd Pletcher explosions at Gulfstream because she has established form outside of Gulfstream. In fact, this is I think her second career start at Gulfstream. I don't love the wandering here but this is a horse I hope she can stay sound because she's pretty good. You know, I think the wander was more function she got to look into the infield she was so far you know in front of everybody kind of lost her focus a bit you can see she kind of pricks her ears and turns her head and Edgar's keeping at her just to kind of like hey we got to finish this thing don't think the job's over in case anybody's running but uh I would say it was more a function of her looking around than anything else. All right. It seemed a little bit odd as she was bearing out, but it did not take away from her victory. This was a nice race, and we're not going to say that she's a horse that's going to challenge untappable divisional leadership, but you know what? She's got some talent. If she can move forward a little bit and hopefully continue racing, she'll do win her share. I, I agree, but I I honestly, don't you think she would have fit very well in the La Cañada? Uh, no, I think she would have galloped. Okay, well, that, that, I mean, I, I was trying to be nice <laughs> about it, but, I, right? Oh, she's a better horse than those horses. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. I, I don't think, I, you know, I, I'm telling you, they should be looking to ship at race like that. I wonder, I don't know, are they still running that race at, at, at Sam Houston? Or maybe that's coming up pretty soon, because that would be a race for a lot of money that would fit for her. But that might be actually coming up very soon. I want to take a look at a couple of races at Oaklawn Park. Uh, I thought it was an ill-advised stretch out for the sprinter Zebros, and I had a conversation with the Zayats who own this horse uh, down, own this horse uh, on Twitter. Zebros will sprint the lead. I guess we're going to look at the whole race. Not surprisingly, Zebros was able to make the lead, but he wasn't able to hold it, Richie. No, and, and he wants to be fast. He's too fast for his own good. Or not really. I mean, he's too fast to go long is really for, what yes. it is. And, he, you know, usually a horse when they stretch out after sprinting for a while, they'll come off the bridle more because the first turn takes them by surprise. He was having none of that. He was running through the bridle on John Court. No, and you know, he didn't run that badly, to be fair. I mean, he finishes third. He only gets beaten by six and a quarter lengths. And as long as they understand after this race that he's a very talented sprinter, and they've told me General George and Carter are the next two spots, and the turn back to seven furlongs will suit him well for his next start. But, you know, obviously it goes well there. You want to take a shot in the million dollar met mile you can't blame them for that but this is a horse that has the possibility of being the best sprinter in the country let's not waste it by running him in races he can't win although now what you're saying going to the general george i actually like the move running here as a prep for the general george. i don't disagree seven eights at laurel the laurel could be a pretty demanding track i think this will put a lot of foundation in him they didn't throttle his speed he still showed good speed so i don't think he's going to be slow next time right. by any stretch of the imagination I think this will wind up being a perfect prep for the general George. Oh, no, no, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. I think it works out very well for him. I think those are very good points. And I just said to them, you know, we were joking about it on Twitter, but I was serious. If it doesn't work out, let's not, you know, think, oh, he ran well enough to give it another try. I mean, obviously, Wayne likes to be in those big route races. It shouldn't be with Zebros. And meanwhile, we're not talking about the winner carve. This is a nice horse, Richie. you got a 106 buyer in here. He can run a little bit. This is a very nice horse. you got to like him a lot. I think it also, though, sometimes it, it, it's such a psychological edge for a horse to take a, a, like a sprinter like Zebros who's stopping, and you go by them so easily that the horse's confidence level, and you can just see them almost physically get bigger and blow up, and they really finish the deal. But, you know, also, it's not as though Zebros set this wacky pace and the race just collapsed and, and Carr fell in the wind. 
he was attacking them the whole way. He wasn't yeah. letting zebras get away from him, and that's not the easiest thing in the world to do because he was making sure that he was keeping him honest effectively, and then he swallowed him up and easily helped the others. He was favored, but he really delivered. No, he, he definitely delivered, and how do you not like this horse? Obviously, for what he does on the racetrack, but you got to love his name, Carl. It's a great name. By First Samurai. I mean, you got to like that, no, right? He's, he's got a very cool name. There's no doubt about it. Whether or not he can contend with the bigger boys, we'll see. I'm sure they're saying their sights on the Oakland Park Handicap in the middle of April. A lot of racing left to go, but Carve is putting his name into the hat for handicap horses. Another horse who's throwing his name in that hat is Ride on Curlin. Now, he hasn't run since being eased in the Belmont Stakes at a mile and a half. Well, he runs half that distance, and there is a serious sprinter on the lead in the one. And right on Curlin, man, he's the red and the outside Richie. I was shocked watching the replay that he won this race because he puts in one heck of a run. And that's not him. He's actually behind him in the two path, behind that horse in pink. He's splitting horses now, Richie. Yeah, and j just really starting to unwind here. Got a terrific ride from John Court, who had been injured on Derby Day last year and uh, has been actually riding really well. You see him splitting horses now. He's going to be moving into third and third. second, coming off the inside. And um, if he had run third here, you would have said that was a good first run. He gets this horse in a lead, and this is a horse that's running some fast figures. The fact that he gets there Look was this ultra run. impressive. This, this was a really, really scintillating return. I watched this race, Richie, and of course, sicko that I am, I'm thinking, man, if I needed the horse who finished second for a score in this race, I mean, you're screaming wire, right? I mean, this is a tough beat. You take three to one with the right sprinter against the seemingly overbet even money ride on Curlin. I'm going to tell you something. You don't do this unless you're a good horse. Oh, absolutely. And it wasn't like the winner laid down. No. He went and got him. I mean, he really laid the body down and went and got him. This was impressive. I never thought, like, sprinting was his thing. And he didn't even break particularly well. He then did work out a very good trip under, under John Court, but he, so he was excellent. I mean, we haven't seen him run in over six months since that since that debacle in the Belmont Stakes. Uh, and obviously, once again, they're looking at the Oakland Park handicap, and I'm sure they're looking at bigger races down the road. And I think he showed in a race like this, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself, but the Met Mile, a one-turn mile at Belmont Park, that has to be the mid-season goal for every handicap horse in the country. It's a million and a quarter on Belmont Stakes Day. And I think right on Curl and show with a race like that, if all things go well, he can be in that race and it could be a very exciting With day. With that turn of foot, a mile might just hit him right between the eyes. And we got to give trainee Billy Gowan yeah. a lot of credit to bring this horse back in such good fashion and get it done. I mean, it was impressive all around. I agree. I like those guys. They were fun to have around the Belmont Stakes time. We saw some nice stuff here in the National Racing Report. We appreciate your watching. Once again, keep in mind, post time during the week will be 1.20, the Saturday and Sunday post time, 12.45, as Richard Migliori and I wrap up the National Race Report. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you next week.